Hey everybody, Scotty Scruggs here. Question for you. Have you ever had a problem or struggle in your life that you simply could not overcome? Maybe a challenge in a relationship, maybe a battle with fear or anxiety, maybe a habit or an addiction that you simply cannot control? Well, 2,000 years ago, this man named Paul, who started some of the very first churches in the first century, wrote about some of the challenges, the struggles in his life. He talked about hardship and pain and brokenness and hunger and loneliness and rejection. He wrote about a thorn in his flesh, some kind of problem or struggle that he simply could not shake, no matter what he tried or how hard he prayed. But amidst all those things, Paul wrote these remarkable words. He said, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. In other words, while it might look like I'm losing, I'm actually winning. But how can you be winning when it feels like you're losing? How can you overcome something that feels impossibly big? Well, Paul said it all goes back to this man named Jesus and what happened on this day we call Easter and a whole lot of water. Sound intriguing? Well, on April 21st, North Shore Community Church is gonna celebrate Easter like we've never celebrated it before. Easter Sunday is my favorite Sunday of the year. I simply can't wait. I hope you'll join us. I hope you'll bring a friend or a neighbor or someone from your work or your school. I hope you'll bring all those really tough questions about what feels impossibly big in your life. Because 2,000 years ago, Jesus was nailed to a cross and placed in a tomb, the greatest sign of the ultimate defeat. But on the third day, he won. And this Easter, it's your turn. Now, we have a very special guest to teach us this morning. John Ortberg is here. John is the senior pastor at Menlo Church in the San Francisco Bay Area. John's a best-selling author and highly sought after teacher and speaker. I've had the privilege of working with John for about 12 years, and I can tell you, John's life speaks even louder and better than his words, and his words are pretty good. So I thought we could embarrass him a little bit by giving him the loudest and most obnoxious welcome a guest speaker has received in the history of guest speaking. Are you ready? Okay, let's put our hands and voices together and welcome John Ortberg. What a fabulous way to start a talk. I feel like I shouldn't say anything because it's going to go all downhill from here. Um, I'm so happy to be here for a whole bunch of reasons. Scotty Scruggs is uh, such a dear friend and a partner in ministry and to have gotten to work alongside of him for so many years and uh, now to be at the church where Scotty is serving and Gary Lindsay, who is a revered guy on our staff and Gary's family is here also. So a big part of my heart and our church's heart is right here in Seattle. And um, we're just so thrilled. And while I'm talking to you here right now, this morning, Scotty Scruggs is back in Menlo Park uh, making jokes about how amazing it is that someone of my advanced age is still able to do ministry. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and I'm here making jokes about how amazing it is someone of his short stature is able to do ministry. So uh, it's just part of the joy of uh, just a very, very deep friendship. And uh, I love Scotty and Nina and Nora, so you take real good care of them, okay? Uh, you take real good care of them, okay? Okay. Uh, and I'm also super glad to be here. It's kind of a homecoming for me. Uh, I grew up uh, in a church, Temple Baptist Church in Rockford, Illinois, that was part of what was then called the Baptist General Conference, now called Converge, and this church is part of that same fellowship. And so uh, it's very much lots and lots of roots. Uh, my own ordination, my call to ministry was expressed through the Baptist General Conference. And I started Baptist and ended up at a Presbyterian church, and Scotty started a Presbyterian church, and now he's at a Baptist church, so there's cross modernization going there. And um, so I, I just am delighted in a whole bunch of ways to be here. And I want to talk really about one text. There's a series going on here at the church about habits. Mostly we live by habit, but the great majority of our behavior and even our patterns of thinking and feeling are outsourced to our habits. So the cultivation of habits is a tremendously important part of spiritual life and spiritual growth. 
The only way to actually live together with God in his great kingdom is for our habits to be transformed by God. And that's what this series is about. And today is about the simple habit of celebration to enter into joy. So I've got one text for today. This is from the Psalms, Psalm 118. The psalmist said, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And I wonder, where does the joy go? Every human being is created, made for joy. But so often, the very things that we think will bring us joy uh, end up having our joy erode. My wife and I have three children now, and they're all 30 and older. But when we had two real little ones, they were like three and one and a half, we were taking a plane ride across the country one time, and we had taken over the whole back row of the plane because nobody wanted to be near us. It was littered with dirty diapers and bottles and spilt milk, and it didn't look good, did not smell good, didn't sound good. You know you're in trouble when the flight attendant asks if your kids could play outside. And we were wondering, why did we bring these kids with us on this trip? Why did we have these kids in the first place? And (laughs) until a guy a couple rows in front of us turned and and looked at our row, and he said to me, are those your two kids? And I thought about it for a moment, and then I said, yes, they are. And he kind of shook his head, and he said, my wife and I would give anything in the world to have two kids. I said, you don't have any kids? He said, no, we have five kids. We'd give anything in the world. (laughs) Don't really want to applaud for that one, actually. It's, but that's the human condition. You know, we just, we're made for joy. And the very things that we think will lead us into joy actually end up creating joy challenges and joy barriers. And often it is children from whom we need to learn. Jesus said, unless you become like a little child. And I think a long time ago about when we had our, at one point, all three of our kids were under the age of four. And I had a custom of bathing them together more to save time than anything else. I knew eventually I would have to stop the group bathing in 10 or 15 years, but for the time being, it seemed efficient. And one time, uh, the littlest one was in the tub, and and another one was out, and uh, I was trying to get the other one dried off. And she was out of the water, but doing what came to be known in our family as the D-Daw Day Dance. This consisted of her running around and around in circles, singing over and over again, Dida Day, Dida Day, Dida Day. It's a relatively simple dance, expressing great joy when she was too happy to hold it in any longer, when words could no longer give expression to her euphoria, and she has to dance to release her joy. That's what she would do, Dida Day, Dida Day. On this particular occasion, I was kind of irritated, and so I said, hurry. And so she began to run in circles faster and say, Dida Day, Dida Day, faster. And I said, No, 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 that's not what I meant. Stop with the Dida Day stuff and get over here so I can dry you off. Hurry. And then she asked me, Why? I had no answer. I had nowhere to go. I had nothing to do. I had no sermons to write. I had no group meetings to lead. I was just so addicted to trying to move things through quickly to get on to the next thing so preoccupied with myself, so trapped in this rut, that here was life. Here was an invitation to the dance before me. And it goes so fast. And I was missing it. So I got up, and I did the Dida Day dance together. And she said I was pretty good at it for a man of my age. (laughs) And reflecting on this afterwards, I realized I tend to divide my minutes up into two categories, living and waiting to live. And an awful lot of my life... I've ended up spending waiting to live in transit, trying to get somewhere, waiting for something to happen, driving, waiting in line, waiting for a meeting to end, trying to get a task completed, worrying about bad, something bad that might happen, angry about something I think that's bad that didn't happen. And those are all moments when I'm not likely to be fully present, not to be aware of the voice and the presence of God right here, right now. I am impatient. I am almost literally, to use a pregnant phrase, killing time, which is another way of saying killing myself. And I had this child who was just wanting to teach me about joy. 
Joy, see, is at the heart of God's plan for human beings. It is not a frivolous topic that we talk about today. And we will never understand the significance of joy in human life until we understand its importance to our God. I think most of us seriously underestimate God's capacity to joy, God's experience of joy. There's a great Christian writer named G.K. Chesterton, and he's got a passage in one of his books called Orthodoxy about God and joy that I just love. He talks about how the joy we see in the happiest child is a tiny little echo of God's joy. And this is what Chesterton writes. Because children have abounding vitality, because they are in spirit fierce and free, therefore they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony, but perhaps God is strong enough to exult in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun, and every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never got tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy, for we have sinned and grown old, and our father is younger than we. Isn't that a fabulous line? We have sinned and grown old, and our father is younger. So, as an exercise in contrast, imagine for a moment what the beginning of the Bible might look like if God were not a supremely joyous being. Imagine if God approached his work as we often approach our work. In the beginning, it was 9 o'clock, so God had to go to work. He filled out a requisition to separate the light from darkness. He considered making stars to beautify the sky and planets to fill the skies, but thought it sounded like too much work. Besides, thought, God, that's not my job. So he decided to knock off early and call it a day, and he looked at what he had done and said, it'll have to do. On the second day, God separated the waters from the dry land, and he made all the dry land flat, plain, and functional, so that, behold, the whole earth looked like Idaho. (laughs) He thought about making mountains and valleys and glaciers and jungles and forests, but he decided it wouldn't be worth the effort, and God looked at all he had done that day and said, it'll have to do. And then God made a pigeon to fly in the air and a carp to swim in the waters and a cat to creep upon the dry ground. And God thought about making millions of other species of all sizes and shapes and colors, but he couldn't drum up any enthusiasm for any other animals. In fact, he wasn't too crazy about the cat. Besides, (laughs) it was almost time for the late show. So God looked at all he had done and said, it'll have to do. And at the end of the week, God was seriously burned out. So he breathed a big sigh of relief and said, thank me, it's Friday. Now, of course, Genesis looks nothing like that. Instead, it throbs with this refrain, and God spoke, and it was so, and God saw. It was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. On the first day, God said, let there be light. What an amazing thing. There didn't have to be light, and there was light, and it's good. And the first day was a Dida day, see, and God did a little dance. And the next day, God said to the light, do it again, and the light did it again. And God danced again, never got tired of it, still does it. And so it is with God. This is life in the Trinity, but not with us, for we have sinned and grown old, and our Father is younger than we. We will not understand God until we understand this about Him. God is the happiest being in the universe. God also knows sorrow. Jesus is remembered as, among other things, as a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. But the sorrow of God, like the anger of God, is his temporary response to a fallen, sinful world. And that sorrow will be banished forever from the heart of God on the day when the world is set right, on the day that we celebrate on Easter. Joy is God's basic character. Joy is his eternal destiny. God is the most joyful being in the universe. And God's intent was that his creation would mirror his joy. 
The psalmist speaks of the sun which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, like a strong man running its course with joy. And this is not just poetic language. This is creation expressing God's unwearying joy at simply being, at existing and knowing existence to be a good thing. As products of God's creation, creatures made in his image, we are to reflect God's fierce joy in life. And this is why the Bible talks about not just joy in general, certainly not escapist joy, but a particular kind of joy. After teaching on the need for obedience, joy always starts with obedience to Jesus, rightly understood, creative, intelligent obedience. Jesus told his friends that his aim was that they should be filled with joy, but not just with any joy. Many people have never thought about this in Jesus. Jesus said, I have said these things to you so that my joy might be in you, and your joy might be complete, filled, running over. In other words, the problem with people, according to Jesus, is not that we are too happy for God's taste, but that we are not happy enough. An old friend, Lou Smeads, put it like this, to miss out on joy is to miss out on the reason for your existence. C.S. Lewis wrote, joy is the serious business of heaven. The Apostle Paul wrote, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. The Bible put joy in the non optional category. Joy is a command. In other words, joylessness is a sin. It's a serious sin. Not a scandalous one. People don't usually get church discipline for being joyless. People don't get kicked out of churches for being joyless. Pastors don't get put on probation for being joyless. But how many churches are filled with joyless followers of Jesus? I grew up, as I said, in a church I'm very grateful for, but th- there were people who'd been around church for a long time, and they had no joy. They attended week after week. They served and gave. One of them is a, uh, is a true story. I will call this guy Hank. It's not his real name, but he's a real person. And, and there was never any indication, or at least not often for those of us that knew him, of any joy. And a moment that I'll always remember was when one of the elders of our church approached him and said, Hank, are you happy? And he said, yes. (laughs) Just like that. No change of expression or tone of voice. And this elder said to him, well, then tell your face. (laughs) And that became one of our favorite expressions around the house for a while because his face didn't know. Uh... We have greatly underestimated the necessity of joy for spiritual life. Nehemiah said to a grieving congregation a long time ago, this day is holy to the Lord your God. What do you associate with that word holiness? This day is holy to the Lord your God. Therefore, do not mourn or weep. There is a time for mourning and weeping. Jesus is a man of sorrows and acquainted for grief, but it is not our basic uh, foundation for life. Do not mourn or weep. Go your way, eat the fat. Isn't that a great verse? Did you know that was in the Bible? (laughs) Eat the fat. Drink sweet wine. Send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. In other words, uh, experience joy yourself and then cause it to overflow for others. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Our strength comes from joy and nothing else can substitute it. But of course, a great problem that we have is and this gets deeply into the issue of habit and that our lives are mostly governed by habits, we cannot make ourselves joyful simply by trying by willpower. So we have to arrange our lives around certain habits that will train us for joy. And that's what I want to talk about in the time that is left uh, for this particular message. I have to say, one of the differences, joy in partnering in ministry is just differences. Scotty is a well-organized person. Have you all noticed that about Scotty? His hair always looks great, doesn't it? And I'm just not organized that way at all. So there's a clock telling me exactly how much time I have left in this message. I don't care. It'll end when it ends. 
Uh, and it actually kind of begins with how we train for joy, and that is you begin right now, this moment, right now. Now, the psalmist says, this is the day. This day that the Lord has made, we will rejoice and be glad in this day. He doesn't say, yesterday was God's day. What a good day that was. Remember how happy we were then? He doesn't say, tomorrow is the day that God will make, and when tomorrow comes, man, I'm going to rejoice then. This day, with all of its shortcomings, is the great deed our day. This day, with all my problems... We live with the illusion that joy will come one day when conditions change. We go to school and think we will be happy when we get out of school. We are single and we're convinced we'll be happy when we get married. We get married and we decide someday we will be happy when we have children, when we get kids in the house. And then we get them in the house and we decide we will be happy when they get out of the house. And then they do, and we think we were happier back when they were home. This is God's day. It is the day that God made. It is the day that Christ's death has redeemed. And if we're going to know joy, it must be in this day today. But this raises a great question for anybody who's thoughtful. How can I embrace joy in the middle of all the pain and all the suffering and all the awfulness of the world? Is it right to even try to be joyful in a world of hunger and violence and where people are trafficked and enslaved and so? And it's precisely here that we make one of the most surprising discoveries about the joy of the Lord. Often, it is people closest to suffering who have the most powerful joy. Friends of Mother Teresa used to say about her that instead of being overwhelmed by the suffering around her, she fairly glowed with joy as she went about her ministry of mercy. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was imprisoned in a concentration camp and ultimately martyred by the Nazis, was remembered by those who knew him then as spreading an atmosphere of happiness and joy over the smallest incident and profound gratitude for being alive. So many people live like, God hasn't done anything for me to praise him for today. My job is dull. My car is old. My hair looks bad. My kids can't get into good college because those movie stars and CEOs are cheating to get their kids (laughs) in. I don't have a spouse, or if I do, I'm pretty sure I got the wrong one. People live as though they have nothing to praise God for day after day. And yet, there is this universe that we live in of light and extraordinary life. And we're told that it exploded from a singularity smaller than the head of a pin and you're alive in it and you woke up and you got another day and your heart beats and your lungs breathe and your mind works and you have a church and you have a God that loves you and the Savior that died for you and the Holy Spirit to guide you and a purpose for this life and the promise of heaven forever and that's just for this is the D-Daw day this is it man if I don't have it today I'm not going to find it and then And then, if you want to train for joy, every once in a while, pick a day to be a day of celebration. Maybe you want to take one day a week, day off or something, to be a day of celebration. Richard Foster wrote a wonderful book about spiritual practices or habits or disciplines called The Celebration of Discipline, and the last chapter is actually on the discipline of celebration. A lot of times when we think about cultivating habits or especially you hear that word discipline, we think about things that are unpleasant. But of course, part of what we're training for is joy. Now, if you have looked much at the Old Testament, you will note that it's filled with feast days. All kinds of feast of the Passover, unleavened bread, something called first fruits, feast of the trumpets, feast of weeks, feast of Purim. And then there's the Sabbath that would come around every week. And then there was an entire sabbatical year every seven years. And then what was called a year of Jubilee. One of the ways that Israel differed profoundly from other ancient peoples were these days that were given to not work and enjoy existence. What's that about? That was about training for joy. That's why that was going on in the Old Testament, because the joy of the Lord is your strength, and you'll have to train for it. So one day a week, make your celebration day, especially if you wrestle with joylessness and you can't just change it by willpower. One day a week, eat food you love to eat, wear clothes you love to wear, listen to music that you love to listen to, enjoy activities that you love to engage in, go places where you love to be, be with people who fill you up with joy. 
because there will be other people in your life who don't fill you up with joy. Some people are like black holes of joy. They suck joy out of you like a Hoover vacuum cleaner. And you say to them, I can't be with you today. This is my joy day. I'll be with you again tomorrow. <laughs> worship, uh, both corporate worship when we all gather together like this, and then individual worship is a very important part of training for joy, changing our minds and our hearts. The psalmist says, give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. And the Bible is filled with scores of commands like this. Now, in our day, a lot of people wonder about this. They wonder, why would the God of the universe want a bunch of people to constantly praise him? It seems a little needy. Can you imagine a movie star or a CEO or a politician so egotistical that they want a bunch of people to stand around telling them how great they are all the time? Yeah, actually, we can imagine that. And people wonder, is God like that? The great thinker C.S. Lewis wrote, when he was a non-believer, this troubled him. Why would God command this all the time? And then he noticed something about the human spirit. When we see beauty or excellence, our experience of it is incomplete until we express our joy. Joy naturally overflows into praise. I landed at the airport yesterday and got in a rental car and started driving up here, and it was a brilliantly sunny day, which I thought was not supposed to happen in Seattle, and Mount Rainier was covered with snow, and then there was this just crystal blue water on the other side. Do you realize what a beautiful place you live in? And I just had to get on the phone and tell people, you should see this. This is unbelievable. Look at this picture. This is what we do. You've got to read this book. You've got to hear this music. You've got to eat at this restaurant. You've got to watch this video. Joy overflows into praise, naturally. It's not fulfilled until it does. Take it another step. Let's say that you are a single man, and the excellence and beauty and goodness that you see is in a single woman. Whom do you want to express your praise to? This may be why there are so many single men in this congregation. <laughs> it's not actually a trick question. Uh, you want to express it to her. Scotty's going to have to talk about this, I guess. Uh, of course, Scotty himself was single a long time, but that's another story altogether. Um, a uh, parent longs to express their delight to the child in whom they delight. A lover longs to praise the beloved. And so God delights in our praise, not because God is needy, uh, in the ancient world, you may know, worship generally involves sacrifice, and often people believed that the gods needed food. In fact, most often in Israel's part of the world, old uh, creation stories taught that human beings were created in order to offer food to the gods, raise it and then sacrifice it. There's a line from God in the Psalms that I love. In Psalm 50, verse 12, God says, if I were hungry, I would not tell you. If I were, in other words, God is not needy, physically or emotionally. He delights in our praise because it means that we are awake to the goodness and beauty all around us. And we all have what might be called a wow threshold. Some people go through the day, oh wow, oh wow, oh wow. It takes so little to trigger thankfulness or goodness or joy or delight. And then other people get jaded or cynical or entitled. And, and, and precisely the same world, the same light, the same creatures triggers no joy at all. So uh, another habit to cultivate to become a person of joy might simply be called noticing. Wake up. Open your eyes. The scripture puts it like this. Psalm 34, verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Anybody can do that, can't they? My dad has suffered for many years from a cavernoma in his brain stem, and it's taken away a lot of the abilities that I just take for granted. A while ago, he suddenly and completely lost the ability to swallow, and they had to put a feeding tube into his stomach, uh, which he will need from now on. 
And my mom and dad had to come to grips with the reality that after 63 years of meals together, they would not share another one. And there, she'll put food from a pouch into that tube and say, okay, John, you're having a hamburger tonight. <laughs> His neurologist recently put him on a brain steroid, and a few weeks ago, he went to the doctor's office, and at the doctor's direction, he swallowed a spoonful of water, one spoonful. And the doctor had him practice swallowing a spoonful of water three times an hour, 12 hours a day, and a few days later, he had his first taste of something, coffee. My dad is a Swede, and when Swedish babies are born, they don't nurse, they start riding on coffee. <laughs> and he thought he had had his last taste of coffee, but two weeks ago, Wednesday, he had another one. Oh, wow. Taste and see. See, it turns out that tasting is not automatic. It is not something to which I am entitled. It is a gift, and it must be cultivated and practiced and done with careful attention. Taste and see. The sun comes up, let there be light. The smile of a friend. Clothes to wear. Food to eat. Maybe a car to drive. Maybe a taste and see, taste and see, taste and see. A mind that can remember. Scripture to make us wise. The life and message and presence of Jesus. It's a gift. It's a gift. But you have to practice. You have to learn. You have to wait, taste and see. And then here's a real simple habit, but I love it. Um, laugh. You know, the call to joy runs all through Scripture. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. The trees of the field will clap their hands. These things I have spoken that my joy might be in you. So what does it take to produce joy in you? What's your laugh threshold? We have a grandson now named Chance who is 10 months old our first grandchild, and he will smile at anything. The other day, somebody jumped, and Chance laughed right out loud. And it was so funny, it was so delightful, we took a video of it. Would any of you like to see and hear a little <laughs> child laughing? Take a look at the screens. I jump. Uh, 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 uh -huh. I think I'll do it again. I'm walking, and... Uh, I jumped so much, I puked. <laughs> Wait, you're just going to wonder, what's going through that tiny little mind to bring so much joy from a simple act? For we have sinned and grown old. I was reading an article in Psychology Today that said the average four-year-old laughs 300 times a day. The average 40-year-old laughs four times a day. What in God's name happened? We have sinned and grown old. But what if little children are right? What if existence itself is a God-created miracle filled with so much wonder that gratitude and delight could be running through us like blood in our veins, and it is our sin, sin and our fear and our lack of trust in God's ultimate power that makes us old and sad and ungrateful. So, so, so. Express a heart of joy and delight and love to God every time that you can think of it. I was reading a book a couple weeks ago, a fascinating book, uh, a novel much about kind of racial injustice called The Hate Give. 
And uh, the author talks about the difference between saying love you and I love you. Never thought about this before. Love you might be said between casual friends, in a conversation, on the run. I love you. That's in a different category. I can still remember when I said those words to my wife Nancy for the very first time. Being Swedish, those are words that do not come easily. So I had literally never said them to a girl before. That was a big deal to me. It was not quite so exciting to Nancy because she'd heard other guys say them to her. And by the time I worked up the nerve to say them, we had been married for several years. <laughs> Somebody was telling me not long ago about a person who asked them, have you ever said, I love you right out loud to God? And they'd never said those words right out loud to God. And when they did, their whole spiritual life changed because in the end, love wins and joy wins. Here's the promise. God says, you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace and the mountains and the hills will break forth before you and the trees of the field will clap their hands. And the apostle John said that the day is coming when God will dwell with his people as their God and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and he will wipe every tear from their eyes and death will be no more and mourning and crying and pain will be no more and then will dawn that great d dot day that will never end so would you pray together with me god thank you so much for your goodness to us god thank you that this morning you said one more time let there be light and there was light and the sun did it again thank you that this morning you opened our eyes and that you made our minds to work and our feet to walk and our lungs to fill up with air and our hearts to beat. Thank you for all of the good gifts that you give to us. Thank you for this church. Thank you for Scotty Scruggs. Thank you for friends that can gather together. Thank you for songs to worship you. Thank you most especially for your greatest gift, your son, Jesus Christ, who lived like nobody ever lived, who taught like nobody ever taught, who died on a cross for our sins like nobody ever died, and then was raised on Easter. Easter Sunday morning, like we will all one day be raised. We praise you. I love you in Jesus' name. And everybody agreed with this prayer, and everybody said amen. amen. God bless you all.